Welcome into the Thunder Basketball Universe presented by Coop Aleworks. As you can tell, we are back in our studio. The Thunder is back home for a brief homestand, but one of the incredible things about working for the Thunder is recognizing some incredible leaders and just groundbreakers in our own OKC community. And with us right now, you might notice if you're watching on YouTube, is a very special guest, and that is Matra Staley Jones, the newly named president of Oklahoma City Community College, OCCC, which we will refer to from here on out. And Matra, we, if, if you're an OG of the Thunder Basketball Universe podcast, you might recognize Matra's voice. We've had her on before. She's a friend of the podcast. And Matra, first of all, congratulations. And thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Absolutely. Congrats. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I always love visiting you all. You're always just full of energy <laughs> and enthusiasm. So it is great to be back. Thanks for this opportunity today. We had to bring you on. And for those who weren't there for the very first podcast, can you just give us a little bit of your journey and your background and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. I am a proud daughter of Ardmore. I grew up in Southern Oklahoma, uh, very humble beginnings. My grandmother raised me. And one thing that always stood out to me was education, mm -hmm. making sure that I um, had opportunities. And so my grandmother taught me not only the value of education, but she really um, instilled the importance of faith, family, and community in me at an early age. And so had a lot of challenges and obstacles to overcome as a result of being someone who grew up in extreme poverty. Um, if, if you take a walk down statistics row, there's probably about a dozen boxes I could check. Mm -hmm. But through um, education, through mentorship, through having um, a, a strong support system, mm -hmm. was able to have countless opportunities. And so graduated with honors from Ardmore High School, I matriculated to the University of Oklahoma, um, where I was a student ambassador in Crimson Club and I was really engaged and involved in all sorts of aspects of, of campus life. So really grew um, a lot professionally and then graduated, moved to the West Coast, took a job out there. And um, my husband and I, Bernard, we got married, moved back to Oklahoma. And I've been here in this community um, working in the nonprofit and education sector, uh, just as serving as an administrator, but really in the resource procurement business, mm -hmm. making sure that students, whether it's children, youth, teenagers, young adults have access, mm -hmm. have resources, have what they need to be able to be successful in life. Part of what really drives me in that regard is because I, I think about my own challenges and my own struggles. And, and everything that I really had to work hard to overcome. And so um, I want to make life easier and better for people despite their backgrounds, despite their you know positions in life, um, to, so that as people you know want to dream and achieve, you know I, I've really worked hard to set an example that you can be whatever it is you want to be. And uh, demographics does not define destiny. That's something that's really important mm -hmm. to me. And so I've been in this community um, giving service and serving in various capacities. And with every opportunity, I've been able to um, increase the number of, of children or students or, or people whose lives that I get to touch. And that that's very rewarding, rewarding to me. Well, it's just you're the perfect person for us to have here with us on the podcast, because when you look at the thunder, like on the masthead is community. And it's something that informs everything that our organization yes. tries to do. And when we look at you, it's the same same types of values. It would have been so easy given sort of the background that you just laid out for you to take all those opportunities and run and never look back. What is it about you, how you were raised, or maybe about this community that made you not do that, that made you want to, to plant your flag here and, and give back the way that you have? It's simple for me, the Oklahoma standard. Mm -hmm. The Oklahoma standard, we really embrace each other. We um, want to see each other survive and excel. And the community I grew up in was very much that way they operated um, in, in that manner, wherein the community really wrapped their arms around me and saw this this scrawny little girl <laughs> <laughs> with this big bushy hair and these pigtails, um, you know, who really had a, had a high aptitude. Uh, for education and, and who excelled and who was eager and, and optimistic and really wanted to um, uh, dream big. And and so people helped me along the way. Mm -hmm. I, I believe wholeheartedly in the value of mentorship. And I've had some exceptional mentors along the way, you know, obviously my grandmother, but 
others in my life that have really stepped up. My husband and I were a unit. You know, he he's walked alongside me as well. And I've had some professional mentors that I'm very proud of. Um, in fact, Erica Lucas from Best, mm. she and I are very, um, we worked hand in hand and, and she, um, that group has done a, a tremendous job as well with just really mentoring women, you know, mentoring um, people so that the challenges and things that we face, we can navigate them together. But um, yeah, I, I just think that I'm happy to be back in Oklahoma. Um, when, of course, I've been back for a long time, but that I've been able to to, to raise a family here. Yeah. You know, I have three amazing children who are just bundles of energy. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I've been saying this because it, it just really touched my heart. Um, when the Board of Regents announced that um, I was the 11th president of Oklahoma City Community College, my six-year-old said, President Mommy? <laughs> <laughs> Is that not the cutest? Yeah. I mean, we, we absolutely, yeah. we, I mean, everybody yeah. laughed. It was the cutest, but my children, um, being able to, to be here and, and, and leave a legacy for them or work on mm -hmm. a legacy for them, mm -hmm. my husband and I, that, that's one of the, the things that I really hold dear. But yeah, Oklahomans, we, we have our act together when it comes to supporting each other. And yeah. of course, very much like the ideals and, and, um, community involvement and kind of the disposition of the Oklahoma City Thunder. Yeah, I've only been here for three years. I've, I've probably been here the least amount of time of every, anybody at this table. But that is one of the first things I noticed, even just from like the interview process with the Thunder. Yeah. Like I was here for two days and that was something I noticed was the people and the way that people treated each yes. other here was yes. very, very, very specific. But Matra, I'm so glad you brought up mentors because um, that's something that has been very valuable in my life and getting to, you know, being where I am in the sport industry. Gallo, I'm sure you can say the oh, yeah. same as well. But for you specifically, can you speak to just the value that mentors have had in your life and some of those and how they've lifted you up and helped you to get where you sure. are? Mentorship is important because, you know, we face challenges. And the one thing we can be sure about life is that it's ever evolving. Mm -hmm. Nothing is constant. There are going to be changes. There are going to be hills and valleys. There are going to be different things that you face that maybe you had no idea, you know, how to how to navigate. And so when you have mentors present in your life, they can help you have a better understanding, face those challenges with um, assurance that you're going to be okay, you're going to make it through. My grandmother has imparted so many pearls of wisdom just in that, you know, when there have been some of those tough days or things that I've had to get through, certainly with the death of my parents um, who, who passed away at early, at, at young ages, you know, just being able to have someone there to encourage you, to lift you up, to say, I believe in you. Um, it's going to be OK. That matters. And there are so many studies that have been done on on mentoring. And you'll you'll notice that it takes one, mm -hmm. just one mm -hmm. one mentor um, to make all the difference in, in the life, uh, the life of someone. And mm -hmm. so just just one person speaking into your life, um, saying, I believe in you, you can do it. That matters to me. And so I've certainly worked in my career and um, the employees that I've been uh, blessed to oversee. We focus strongly on setting an example. Mm -hmm. What can we do and, and how can we ensure that our actions and the things that we put out in the universe are not only received, but people are inspired by that. That's something that I really hold dear is being able to um, to lead by example. Mm -hmm. Well, with that in mind, I, I kind of want to flip the question a little bit. And there may be viewers, teens, college kids, parents wondering about this for their children who are looking for a mentor. And some might look around and say, who, who could be that for me? I don't see anybody that can be that mentor for me. As someone, as you were sort of describing your journey, What's what's your advice for kids or parents who are trying to you know get their kids um, on the right track or even adults who are looking to make a, a change in their life? Like, sure. How do you find those people and what do you look for in those types of people? You, you look at, um, the, you know, the networks that you have. So, you know, if I were, were, were talking to a parent, I would say, you know, start with your church, your community, your um, your your neighborhood even your place of employment, um, children's schools. You have so many people that um, are willing to step up 
but you know, it has to be someone that you trust. But there, when you start within your your community and your friends and um, that network, people will happily and proudly step up to be able to pair, you know, your your child or even you with someone. Oftentimes, what I've found to be the case is that people are nervous to ask. And as someone yeah. who's in the resource procurement business, <laughs> <laughs> there is no fear when it comes to asking. Right? Yeah. <laughs> when people, um, when I reach out and I'm asking to make them, you know, to schedule a meeting or to go and visit with, with um you know, various constituencies. They know if, if Matra Jones is coming, there's likely going to be an ask associated <laughs> a with question it. question coming. <laughs> you know, but that's what it's about. So people yeah. are afraid to ask. Um, you know, there's there's an adage, you, you have not because you ask not. And that is yeah. true, ask, you know. Um, and people will point you in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Schools, places of employment, community, community centers, churches, just different Neighborhoods, there are so many um, places to find mentors. Again, someone that you trust. Um, but but yeah, I'm a proponent because I always say I, I'm not here um, by my own merits. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've had to put in the work. Yes, I've had to get the requisite training. Executive leadership is nothing that's new to me. I've done it practically my entire professional career. I was groomed. Uh, by President David Bourne and some amazing faculty and staff at OU. Um, even even as a as a as a youth, as a, in 4-H, all those different activities mm-hmm. and programs really poured into me and taught me to be bold and, and walk in confidence and, and have um, no fear when it comes to leading and and, and charting a, a course or a path and and really blazing a trail. But I will say that um, there are lots of opportunities and people just have to ask. Mm-hmm. Well, Matra, not just with OCCC, but just in the Oklahoma City community, we know you were very, very involved and you've obviously broken some glass ceilings with OCCC, blazed a trail. For those who are watching, for those who maybe don't have a mentor or haven't seen somebody in the position that they want to do that looks like them, what does it mean to you to be that sort of, be an inspiration to others who might want to trail a very similar path that you have? It's it's an incredible feeling because when I set out to do the work um, that I that I've been engaged in for my entire professional career, I never thought that you know others would would say, "Oh my goodness, that is so cool! I want to do that." Mm-hmm. That that wasn't my intent. My intent was simply to make a difference. My intent was simply to make life easier um, for people whose backgrounds and experiences mirror mine. Mm -hmm. Because as a child, you don't really understand um, why you're born into certain circumstances. And there were so many days, there were a lot of painful days, a lot of painful days. And so I just remember feeling, um, you know, throughout my childhood and even um, as as a teen, life has to offer much more. And I'm going to do everything in my power such that if I can ease just a little bit of what someone's going through, I'm going to do that. That's the kind of work I want to be involved in. I want to be involved in life altering uh, work, work that impacts generations, that changes the trajectory because I had people do that for me and give me hope. And so to to now be at a place to where I have essentially made history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's very meaningful, but it's not something that I take lightly. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't take it for granted. Um, I not only hold it dear, I want to continue to inspire. And I want to continue um, to lead by an example, but more than that, show people that anything is possible, anything. The sky, it, it, it's essentially the way I look at things, even in my current state, the sky is still the limit. Right. And so as you are in these educational settings and these opportunities, what does that maybe practically look like for you to help teenagers and college kids? And, you know, there's this, every year there's going to be a new cohort of people coming in to the place that you're you're in charge of that are hoping that the sky is the limit for them too and they're looking to carve out a career path you know what, what 
what's your approach to to that as you're sort of helping these kids get off sure. into the real world sure. with their education? So here's the thing, I'm not I'm not at this alone. Yeah. Mm. I have an incredible board of regents, incredibly talented faculty, staff, administrators, students, community members, donors, alumni. <laughs> There are a great deal of constituencies that I will work to engage so that we can forge this path together. It's my goal to create one OCCC. We're we're moving as a unit. We're doing everything together. We're um, accomplishing the goals that have been set forth for us together. And so when you have that unification, there's nothing you can't accomplish. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be able to really impact our students' lives. We're going to be able to have people excited, continue that excitement. OCCC is a beautiful place. It's, it's, we're, you know, in our 50th year and I'm excited to be a part of the legacy. There's been great work done and I just am happy to be a part of continuing that legacy and and moving, moving our mission forward. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, you mentioned earlier that you are making history. And I'm just curious if during February, during Black History Month, do you contemplate on that more than you would have? Or, you know, what's what, what's your approach to to this month in general as an educator, but also for yourself as a person? I think about uh, the work that I've done constantly, yeah. all the time. Black History Month as a collective is a way for us to honor the many contributions African-Americans have made. Um, the perseverance, the, the, the boldness, the, the character, the tenacity, everything that um, people of color have had to really overcome. And um, so as a collective, it's a way to recognize those contributions and to honor them. Individually, it's a time for me to reflect on the giants mm-hmm. on whose shoulders mm-hmm. I stand, my ancestors, the mentors, the many people who have impacted my life. And so, you know, while we have this month to do that and we honor it, I think about these things throughout the year because the work never stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There's so much work to do. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things that you have said just in this interview is that demographics doesn't define your destiny. And I oftentimes think same, similarly during Black History Month of, you know, those who have blazed the trail, but it also makes me think about the future and what's next, what what work needs to be done, what are, what's coming up. And you saying that makes me think like, OK, there's there's work to do, but we're turning a corner. And I, I just want I I really loved that you put it that way. Demographics doesn't find your define your destiny. And. I, I kind of want you to go a little bit deeper into that. Like, what is sure. what does that mean, and what what does that look like for you? So, when I worked at the Kip School under the leadership of uh, Tracy McDaniel, who is now retired, fabulous educator, uh, fabulous trailblazer in his own right, Kip, um, I believe, still is, but certainly under his leadership and during my tenure there, was one of the highest performing schools in the state. Tracy really helped me understand um, that we had to really um, walk delicately with our students Mm -hmm. because they they were all from underserved communities. And there was so much that I learned from him. And that was, that was a saying that he was, okay, these demographics that it's not going to make, you know, it's not going to make or break anyone. We're going to, and so uh, demographics doesn't define destiny. We, we, we dealt with students from all over the city and, you know, there were some, there were some um, hard days because, you had students who didn't have the essentials and, and having to navigate through through that and still lead with optimism and still be there for the students. That was I mean, that was it was heart wrenching to watch and to experience. But essentially, it means it doesn't matter where you come from or your background or your position mm-hmm. or your status or whatever it is. And that's across the board. Mm-hmm. It doesn't define your destiny. So I'm not talking about just those from underserved communities. I'm talking about whatever your demographics are. It doesn't define your destiny. You get to define your destiny. The the way that you just phrased that reminded me actually of something that 
our coaching staff talks about a lot, which is they talk about walking with our players and that each of them has their own path. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious, maybe from your perspective, given your life path, you know, the value of having somebody walking with you through these, these challenges or through the great times too, the way that you're describing at Kip and, you know, what, what somebody that is walking alongside you like that can do for, for a person long-term. I'm a living example. I've had some uh, tremendous leaders pour into my life and, um, you know, give me some sage advice and wisdom, both personally and professionally. And I think that the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of those things. I will always say that I, I didn't make it here by myself. I made it here through God's grace, through um, some help along the way, a lot of help along the way. I think what I would what I would advise people, my advice to to those who um, are in need of a mentor or who, you know, have someone walking alongside them, listen, listen, take advice, but don't take advice from someone who hasn't been where you're trying to go as it pertains to your career yeah. and as it pertains to things you want to accomplish. I've found that different mentors have served different purposes, if that makes right. sense. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's sometimes you rely on um, advice from people who've not necessarily been where you're trying to go. And they, that pers they don't have the perspective necessary to push you. You know, they may have um, sage advice in other areas, which is wonderful, but it takes all kinds is the point I'm trying to right. make. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just encourage people to continue to um, to listen, to um, look at things with eyes wide open, to not be naive. I've had to learn a lot and I'm still learning and I will yeah. continue to learn. Mm -hmm. That's why education is so important to me. But yeah, I, I am happy to be at this place. Uh, it makes my heart happy. I'm happy to be able to be of greater service to this great state. Uh, I love Oklahoma with everything in me because Oklahoma has has just been an incredible place for me to grow, learn, um, dream, achieve, and raise a family. Mm -hmm. Well, Macho, we could literally talk to you yeah. all day long, which is why we love having you on the podcast. We, we don't just get to talk to an amazing person, but we also leave with some incredible yeah. advice and just a little more inspired, too. So thank you Happy so much that. for your time. And we really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing all the great things you do at OCCC. Thank, thank, thank you so much. I appreciate everything. And go Thunder. Congratulations again. <laughs> Thanks. We're going to take a short break right here and we'll be right back. Coop L Works is the proud sponsor of Thunder Basketball Universe. Brewers of the fan favorites F5 IPA and 99 Calorie Ice Chest IPA. You'll find those and many more Coop beers at retailers across Oklahoma. Learn more at CoopLWorks.com. Welcome back. What an incredible interview with Dr. Matra Staley Jones. And um, it's all flashing back to me why she was so incredible to have as a guest on our podcast a couple of years ago. I'm so happy we were able to bring her back. Yeah, just incredible insight. So wise. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, just you feel like every time we talk to her, we learn something. I feel better just as like a human being. <laughs> um, and it's so cool to see her making such a big impact yeah. in the Oklahoma City community, uh, as we talked about in the interview, which is like, this is what the thunder is about yeah. outside of the lines is, you know, what can we do to help elevate our community? And she's a prime example of somebody who is continuing to break barriers mm -hmm. and is doing so with so much grace and warmth and intelligence all at the same time. <laughs> Breaking glass yeah. ceilings and not just with OCCC, like I mentioned in the interview, but just in the community in general. She's involved in so many different things. I feel like we hear her name a lot just around the Oklahoma City community. So an inspiration to us and of course to, us, I can only imagine, a bunch of people that are just looking up to her in yes. her position. So we hope you enjoyed listening to that just as much as we did having the conversation and, you know, just a, a great celebration during Black History Month to recognize that there are people that are making history right, right now. now. 
Yeah. Black history is made yeah. every single day. And that is something that we should remember throughout the entire year. But we also have some other things that we have to catch you yes. up on since our last podcast. As we mentioned in our last podcast, we were in Dallas when we last spoke to you. And so the Thunder has played several games since then. The first one took place in Portland. And this was just a wild road trip for yeah. a lot of different <laughs> reasons. We mentioned the crazy weather that we encountered in Dallas that took us, it delayed our arrival to Portland until the next day. But once we got in Portland, it, things weren't done being crazy there. They, they were not. <laughs> so we, um, we had a, you know, a, a bit of a, a situation. Mm -hmm. Chris Fisher uh, was, was out. Matt Pinto, our radio play-by-play -play guy, he was out. He was under the weather. And so we both were, you know, next person up. And so I, I stepped into the play-by-play -play role for our Bally Sports Oklahoma broadcast. You took a, the sideline solo and you walked us off with Josh Giddy in a walk-off win as the Thunder beat the Blazers 96-93 on the road to make it three straight wins for the Thunder. Gallo, we're not just going to breeze over the fact that you stepped into we're, the play-by-play play play chair. that right past everybody and just move along. <laughs> because here's the biggest thing here. Gallo had about three hours of lead time before the game tipped off that he knew that he was going to be stepping into the play-by-play -play chair. And what stands out to me still to this day that I cannot believe is that you were just ready for it. You, it, you didn't need much time to do any extra work or prep. Like, sure, maybe you probably had to, I don't know, maybe go over a couple of pronunciations a little more. I don't know. But you were ready. A, a couple little things. And I, I will say huge, huge thank you to uh, Dan Mahoney, our, our vice president, and the, the one who trusted me in that mm -hmm. position um, and said, next man up, you're in. Huge, huge shout out to Eric Date, our Bally Sports Oklahoma director, Steve Melton, our producer, who I went into the TV truck in Portland. They were in the middle of doing some other stuff. And I said, hey, can we sit down and just go through the rundown <laughs> of <laughs> everything that we have going on? And then massive shout out to Michael Cage for going with the flow. He was excellent. I probably talked too much, probably talked too little at certain times. And he just filled in the blanks um, wherever. And huge shout out to you. Your positivity, your encouragement was amazing. Team Gallo, um, just all day. <laughs> like, yes. So I had massive, massive amounts of help. The one thing that I will say is, you know, I am proud of the fact that for the last couple of years, I've been preparing right. every game day to potentially have to to step into that role. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing extra prep work um, every game. You know, during COVID, we just know that things are crazy and right. everything can change in, at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, preparation, meeting opportunity, um, certainly uh, – came into into play in in Portland so um that was very exciting and I'm I'm very grateful for all of the the well wishes and congratulations I got on that and I am very happy that Matt Pinto is back and feeling better and yes. Chris Fisher is back in the fold too so now our team is complete <laughs> we are back yeah. at full tilt yeah. and Gally did a fantastic job <laughs> did very very well and the epitome of stay ready so you don't have to get ready exactly there I've learned go. a lot from Mark Dagnall you know it's <laughs> yeah. crazy how yeah. basketball lessons translate into real life no doubt about <laughs> that's it that's why we love yeah. this sport <laughs> and the Thunder won so we are officially 1-0 in the yeah. Thunder Gallo or in the Nick Gallo era and you got to Walk it, walk it off with Josh Giddy with your parents in the building. <laughs> with what my was parents that like? in the building, yeah. that was so crazy. And it was kind of funny because my parents were actually a little salty that they were in the building, so they couldn't actually watch the walk-off <laughs> interview because we were on the road. And right, so it's right. like they don't put it up on the Jumbotron or anything like right, that. Right. And so they were a little salty, but they saw it on Twitter later. They I was going to say, we'll get them the clip if they want to relive <laughs> it, which I'm it sure they're going to over and over and over If again. they haven't yeah. already <laughs> sent it out to the rest of the yeah. family. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But a great win, like we mentioned, yeah. for the Thunder in Portland. That was just a, a great game by the Thunder. Um, they were down a, a lot of players in that yeah. game, um, obviously playing without Shea Gilgis Alexander, but a lot of different guys stepped up, balanced scoring. The Thunder bench in that game, Mike Muscala, Kim Rich Williams. I mean, they all just stepped up. And when their numbers were called, they responded. Another double digit comeback win for the mm -hmm. Thunder. A really efficient night off the bench. You mentioned Ty Jerome, Kenrich Williams, yeah. Mike Muscala. And then, you know, guys just making plays all over the floor. Um, high assist numbers, high assist ratio. And, you know, it was just great, well balanced attack. And then, you know, we had to, to Sacramento on the second night of a back-to-back -back yep. after that. And 
it's a tough road trip already to that right. point. And the Thunder, they left it all on the floor in Sacramento. wasn't quite enough. No Shea, no Lou in that mm-hmm. game. And they still gave Sacramento everything they could handle. One of my favorite quotes, and then we, we didn't play You Can Shea that again today just because we had the interview with Matra. But one of my favorite quotes from after that Sacramento game is by Darius Baisley, who had an incredible performance in that game. He said, it was a challenge, but there's beauty in that. Yep. And that was so well put and succinct by Darius. And it speaks to the mentality that this entire Thunder roster has of when we're met with challenges, we have a choice. We can either fold and we can fall to the ground and say, woe is me. Or we can take it head on, take the lick, taste our own blood for a second and learn from it, get back up and be better because of it. That's exactly how everybody's approaching it. Even if they're undermanned, they're not going to make excuses. Even right. if they are the, you know, le- the less strong. The, the less strong team out there on the floor of the younger team, they're not going to make an excuse out, out of it. They can always compete. They can always fight hard and they can always play to their competitive level. And that's what they did. And that's they're learning from each and every one of these opportunities on the floor. Yeah. And even if things don't look pretty right this second, I mean, Josh Giddy talked very openly about how, you know, he's go- going through the ringer right now yeah. on some of his defensive assignments and he's learning that Harrison Barnes is a tough cover and he's a guy that's going to get to the free throw line. He's going to jab step and pump fake you to death. And then, you know, the next two nights later, he's in a matchup with the Golden State Warriors and going toe to toe with guys that have won multiple championships. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just a, it's a matter of, you know, taking the lumps, taking the lessons and then enjoying the victories when you get them, whether they be actual W's on the, you know, the standings or whether it's the small victories within the games right. that you're you're making these little jumps. And, and I would say the way that the Thunder responded in the second half against Golden State, mm-hmm. that was a win, even if the final score wasn't a win. I want to talk about a couple yeah. of those small victories in the Golden State game. Now, the Thunder fell short in that game. They had a lead coming out of the first quarter. They mm-hmm. looked really, really good, really sharp. They were they held Golden State to just 20 one, points. In yeah, the first quarter, 20 yeah. points in the first quarter and one for six from the three-point line or something like that. They yeah. were not shooting the ball well from deep. And this is the Golden State Warriors team who leads the league in three-pointers made per night. But they were sharp in their coverages. They were playing really well. And it was really just like untimely turnovers and some really timely three pointers by golden state that really gave um, the warriors the edge in this game. But there were a couple of plays gala where we kind of looked at each other and we were like, wow, that was incredible. The first one was a jump ball that turned into a tip to a tip (laughs) to a layup with 2.5 seconds left on the shot clock. I'll let you explain this play, but it, it was a one, a great example of high IQ and awareness by a couple of really young Thunder players. Right. So the Thunder didn't even win this jump ball that happened in front of the, the, the hoop that the Thunder's trying to score on. But Josh Giddy, he does this beautiful mind thing where he can like <laughs> see the play develop before it even is happening. I mean, he said that he said that he kind of read what might happen before the ball got even th- uh, thrown up in the air. Mm-hmm. So the ball gets tipped towards him, but not really in a place where he could grab it. So six foot eight, he just jumps up and slaps it to Darius Baisley, who was down by the block mm-hmm. across the lane from where Josh was. Mm-hmm. Baze has the presence of mind to catch the ball, twist his body, get it to his left hand, which is his dominant hand, and bank it in off the glass before the shot clock expired. Just an incredible display of basketball IQ and headiness. It took us, what? two minutes to explain that play (laughs) and it happened in two and a half seconds and a snap of a finger all before the shot clock the shot clock didn't even go off that's how fast it happened just great presence of mind great awareness the other play i want to talk about was in the fourth quarter and it was the longest it was i think that was the shortest possession of the game this was the longest possession of the game for the thunder and it was because there were a, a string of five consecutive offensive rebounds just hustle intensity, competitiveness, and these guys were just in it. They wanted yes. this so bad. And, and so was the Paycom Center crowd. They oh were goodness. in it too. It yeah. was incredible. And so the Thunder missed just one three after another, after another, after each and every one. Derek Favors probably came up with about three of them. At least, yeah. Kenrich Williams got one, and I, and Lou got the last one. The capper. Lou said, I'm done with these three pointers. <laughs> <laughs> this ball is going through the hoop one way or the other. So he swooped in after the last three pointer missed by Ty Jerome, swooped in from the three point line, just caught it with two hands and slammed it back through the rim. Right over Steph Curry. Sent yeah. the crowd into a frenzy. Just an incredible show of relentlessness. And I love the the dichotomy of those two plays and the fact that we called them out here because 
One is basketball IQ and intelligence, and the other is relentlessness. Mm. And you have to have both of those things. You have to play smart and you have to play hard. Mm -hmm. And you can't give up in this game because it's a 48-minute game. And as Mark Dagnalt said about the first play, you know, games last two hours and 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Only 48 of those minutes are actually played between the lines. Right. So there's almost an, an hour and a half mm -hmm. of time that you've got to be thinking the game as well. And be and, engaged. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be winning that hour and a half just as much as you have to be winning the 48 minutes between the lines. And the Thunder, to its credit, is doing that more and more as the season goes along. And as we zoom out big picture, as they continue to make those strides, both winning on the floor and off the floor, they're going to be a better team as the as the weeks go on, as the months go on, as the years go on. And it's encouraging too because after the game, something that Coach said that really stuck with me was, you know, I wish we could have executed better in a couple of different spots of the game, but our competitive level was there. Right. And you can work with that. That's something you can always fix execution. You can always fix like skill and, and tactical things, but you can't coach competitiveness. You can't coach hustle. That it has, has to happen. That can't waver throughout 48 minutes. And that's what the Thunder's been building to up into this point and instilling in their players. So a really encouraging sign by the Thunder group and, and what was a really tough matchup for the, for the team. For sure. And now we look ahead. We do. The Thunder has one more game in their very brief homestand. That's going to be on Wednesday against the the Toronto Raptors. Right. From there, the team heads off to the, the East Coast. So another stretch of four games and six nights coming mm -hmm. up. And actually, the Thunder just finished up a stretch of four games and six nights. Yep. When they were on the road, they were in a stretch of four games and six nights. It's just these things are sort of relentless at this stage of the schedule yeah. leading into the All-Star break. But the Thunder goes to Philadelphia on Friday flies back to the central time zone to take on Chicago on Saturday. So the next night, second night of a back-to-back -back Super Bowl Sunday off in New York and then take on the New York Knicks inside Madison Square Garden on Monday. That is Valentine's Day. It sure is. And you can always watch those games on Valley Sports Oklahoma. Be sure to stay tuned to OKCThunder.com and at OKC Thunder on all social channels to keep you up to date on everything that's happening for the Thunder throughout that stretch and beyond. Of course, we've got you covered. And be sure to stay tuned to the Thunder Basketball Universe podcast because we've got you covered here as well. But until then, we want to thank you so much for joining, watching, and listening. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. If you're not watching us on YouTube, be sure to go check us out and subscribe there as well. Thank you so much to our producer and OCCC alum, Matt Bishop. Thank you so much. And we'll catch you next time. Thunder up and catch you later.